Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good morning. I'm Rabbi Jenny Greenspan for Congregation Bethel Zedek. And I am so glad that we are gathering for Torah talk this morning on one of my favorite Torah portions, uh, Beshalach. Uh, Beshalach being the, uh, the Torah portion in which we actually go out from Egypt, in which we actually leave the bondage of slavery and uh, head out into a long, long journey of figuring out who we are as a people, uh, which is how I tend to think about the rest of the wandering in the Bamidbar, in the, in the wilderness that we will see for much of the rest of the Torah, a mixture of laws and wandering. Um, so I'm, I love this moment when we are shifting from one to the other. Uh, and this, this Shabbat, also called Shabbat Shira, because it includes the Song of the Sea, you know, this year has been a hard year to sing together, but I hope that we all find a moment to uh, sing this Shabbat, whether you sing along with us in service later uh, on the live stream, or you just take a moment to sing. Uh, singing is such a great way to show joy, and this is Shabbat Shira, so I, I hope we bring that, uh, but before, and, uh, and I will dive into a different section on the learning uh, this morning, but first I want to say a Shabbat Shalom and a welcome to everyone here so far. I see I've got the seagulls joining, Shabbat Shalom to Michael Kahn, to Ellen Hamburger, to Renee Fout and Jody Zucker. Jim Roth and Marsha Sclair, so many joining us, Eric Hogan, Cheryl Too, Phyllis Luger, Marty Lip, so good to see all of you so frequently and uh, so good to see each of you joining me uh, live each week and I'm sure others join us on the uh, by watching the recording later. This week, uh, go ahead and go if you would like a copy of the Etz Chaim Humash, uh, the uh, Mash that we would usually be using in person. If you'd like a PDF, as usual, just go to bez613.org and select the tab that says Virtual Shabbat Resources. And then you can scroll down to the uh, Etz Chaim link on the Torah Talk resources, uh, where you will get a copy of the PDF of Parashat Beshalach, of the portion Beshalach. If you are using a physical copy of the Etz Chaim Chumash, I will be focusing today, or if you're using the PDF, I will be focusing today really on page 413, but I'll pull a little bit from 412. So if you want to jump to 412, uh, either in your PDF or in your hard copy, you can go ahead and do so. If you're using a different version of the uh, Chumash, if you're using another edition other than Etz Chaim, I will be in Exodus chapter 15 verse 20. So I'll give everyone a moment to scroll to those, to flip to those, and to track that down. We'll be on Exodus 15, verse 20. If you're in an Chaim edition, it's on page 412. Um, and I'll say also Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Carol Steinfeld and to Alex Binder. So good to see so many. Um, so as I said, this week's portion is called Beshalach, which means, and he sent, Pharaoh sent us out. Uh, sent the Israelites out of Egypt uh, and then changed his mind and sent a, uh, an army following us. And God does the miracle of splitting the sea. There's a beautiful midrash about Nachshon ben Aminadav, one of the leaders of one of the tribes who is the brave one to step forward and have some faith in that the waters will uh, not be the barrier that they appear to be. The midrash is as he gets further into the water, uh, his faith is uh, tested, and then God splits the waters for them. And they go through the waters, and much of chapter 15 is called Shirat Hayam, the song of the sea. It's called such for the song that Moses leads all of the Israelites in immediately following that song. Miriam, Moses' sister, that the Torah identifies her here as Aaron's sister, both are true, um, leads the women in dancing and singing, which we'll see in the verse we're about to look at. So there's this beautiful, dramatic moment of song and of joy. Uh, I don't know how many listen to the podcast uh, Hidden Brain, the NPR podcast, but a month or two ago, they had an episode looking at what does relief feel like? And one of the forms of relief is that moment when you would think that everything is about to come crashing down and you think you won't survive. They shared the story of people on a safari uh, and their Jeep stopped working um, and the, the attempt to turn the ignition um, attracted the attention of some lions and suddenly the people on the safari felt as though they were 
prey. And um, another Jeep comes and, and ends up trying to rescue them. The tow rope breaks and the lions jump for the tow rope to play with it, just as kittens would. Um, it was a very beautiful story. And they share that most of the people on that Jeep in their moments of fear immediately switched to elation that they left and they sing. And I imagine the Israelites feeling something similar when they sing as they leave uh, the sea. And they're in this amazing high of joy and of elation and of relief that their suffering and oppression is over. The army that was pursuing them is gone, cannot get them. And then almost immediately, they, it all falls down for them. This is where I wanted to we'll glance at verses 20 and 21, and then we'll focus a little bit more on 22 through 25. So we see immediately after this song, toward the end of this elation, then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand. You may have Debbie Friedman in your mind right now. Um, and all of the women went out after her in dance and with timbrels. And Miriam chanted for them, sing to Adonai, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and driver, God has hurled into the sea. So in this moment of that initial elated relief, and then Moses says, all right, let's go. And Moses caused Israel to set out from the Sea of Reeds. I'm on page 413 in the Etzheim, chapter 15, verse 22, if you're following along in another edition. And they went out into the wilderness of Sheur. They traveled for three days in the wilderness and found no water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. That it was that was why it was called mara. The word mar in Hebrew, uh, you might recognize the word maror from our seder. Mar is uh, is bitter, and the people grumbled against Moses. What shall we drink? So he cried out to to God, and God showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. I want to focus on that little moment of this water that gets cast into the this wood, this piece. To be shot was this past week, and we're looking at a piece of wood, a little bit of a, a tree. In Hebrew, the word eights can mean wood, or it can mean a whole tree, or it can just mean wood. So it could be a whole tree here. But God directs Moses to take this piece of wood or this tree and says, Vayorehu Adonai eights vayishlach al el hamayim vayim teku hamayim. God shows him this piece of wood, says, throw it into the water, and the water becomes sweet, becomes drinkable, and becomes the reason that they can survive. So a lot of commentary goes into what is up with this particular tree. And with Tu Bishvat this past week, I thought it would be a fun place to focus, uh, Tu Bishvat being our celebration of trees. Um, many of the commentators see this as yet another time that God is doing a miracle for our people, uh, following the plagues, following the splitting of the sea. Uh, and here is one more time. Immediately after redemption, they're already complaining about water. And God says, fine, here's one more miracle. This piece of wood will turn your water, turn this bitter water sweet. Uh, some Kabbalistic commentaries even suggest that this particular tree is not just any tree, but it's actually a sapling of the tree of life uh, from the Garden of Eden that God has miraculously brought here so that this tree of life from the Garden of Eden can create this sweet water. And I think there's actually a much more rational explanation. I actually think that this is a time that God is not showing God's own might in the miracle, but reminding Moses and the Israelites of the miracles that exist in the very fabric of creation. I want to bring two commentators who suggest similarly. The first is Bechor Shor, one we don't tend to reference as much, uh, but he was he also lived in Middle Ages France around the same time as Brashi, whom we're more familiar with. But he said, God showed Moses this piece of wood. If God had wished to do this without this piece of wood, God could have. God could have just said, okay, boom, the water is sweet. Or told Moses to use the uh, staff that Moses has been using to direct God's miracles so much. But, but this time, it is God's way to do miracles according to the way of the world. So according to the way of the world. So Behor Shor seems to be saying that there's something 
already innate in wood that can make this water sweet. And we have Kuni, who lives about a hundred years later, who comes to him, or to comes to the same verse and said, that God taught Moses about a certain kind of wood that he tossed into the water. Although God had other means of making this water sweet without using any particular kind of wood, God wanted to teach Moses some common chemistry as in how to use natural products to sweeten something that only needs sweetening in order to make it drinkable or edible. Um, as my husband has pointed out to me, Moses is probably being showed the yeast that lives on the tree. <laughs> or as Chris Cooney is saying, these, uh, the, the natural chemistry. Yeast was how in the ancient world, uh, you could turn water to beer. And when water was bitter or often full of, of toxins that could kill someone. Fermentation was a common way to make water safe to drink. It turned it into a very, very low alcohol level beer. And for much of, the, of human history, beer was actually safer to drink than water. And so perhaps here, the yeast on this piece of wood is turning this water from a bitter, dangerous, potentially poisonous water into a sweet water or perhaps a light beer that would be therefore be safe to drink and, and help them to get hydration without risking disease. And so for both Chris Cooney and Behor Shore, this isn't God doing one more miraculous miracle with the mighty hand and the outstretched arm that we have seen for so much of the early Exodus story. But this is God teaching about the miracles that are, exist in nature. And when we celebrated Tuvishva, we're looking at trees and all that trees can do, all that they bring to us in nature. And so I think what we can learn from this is a recognition that the, there are miracles in the fabric of creation and there are resources all around us in any given time that we come down from a moment of elation and then find ourselves in a moment of crisis, perhaps we don't need one more miracle to save us. Perhaps we should look around and find the tree, find the miracle already in creation and look for our resources. Find the resource that will save us from any given problem. For the Israelites here, it was a very physical, uh, physical problem of needing water for us, it may be physical, it may be spiritual, it may be emotional, it may be financial, all kinds of ways. But perhaps this piece of wood is coming to teach us that we often have resources around us if only we learn to take a look and search them out. Uh, so as we step forward into our wandering, um, of, into the desert. I hope that we can also take a moment as we wander into the next few months of uh, figuring out what the 2021 will look like. Uh, we also take a moment to look at the miracles already in the fabric of our creation around us. The miracle that is scientists being able to develop a vaccine for us so that we may move past this COVID uh, pandemic reality uh, that we have been in recognize all that is already here at our fingertips that we may have missed in the first place. So leave us here. I'll say Shabbat Shalom and hope that we can always find our resources. I hope that you'll join me at 10 o'clock on the live stream for our main service. Uh, we'll be celebrating the Bar Mitzvah of David Simpson. Uh, and I will note, if you would prefer to join me live rather than recording next week for Torah Talk, I will be at 9 o'clock. So we're going to move a half hour early if you're going to join me live next week uh, so that I can also spend some time with our tots and have a little bit of a Tat Shabbat celebration next week as well. Uh, so just giving a heads up there if you'd like to join me in person next week. The recording will, of course, always be available if 9.30 is a better time for you in the morning. So leave us there. Shabbat Shalom, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. I'll say Shabbat Shalom to the Ashworths and to Larry Spector for joining us. And yes, Miles, I think first, uh, Chris Cooney is picking up on it, the, the very first, uh, <laughs> a, a very first uh, chemistry experience, uh, experiment. I'll say Shabbat Shalom, and I look forward to seeing you soon.